بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم آئی ایم فخر لودی اینڈ دس از اور فورٹی تھرڈ لیکچر آف فارول میتھڈس فار سافٹ ویئر انجینئرنگ اینڈ وی آر ڈسکسنگ پیٹری نیٹس وی اسٹارٹیڈ ٹو ڈسکس پیٹری نیٹس ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر اینڈ وی سا افیو ایگزامپلس سمپل ایگزامپلس آف پیٹری نیٹس پیٹری نیٹس آر بیسکلی یوزڈ for defining and specifying concurrency and non-determinism in programs. Remember, our concurrent programs in a distributed system environment or even in a non-distributed system environment where we need concurrency, for example, operating systems and uh, those kind of things, We need to handle concurrency where we need to deal with all the issues such as uh, synchronization, uh, deadlocks, starvation, and so on and so forth. Petrinets are a, is a very useful tool to specify those properties and those kinds of systems. I would also like to mention here that, you know, otherwise... Uh, specification of uh, such systems, specification of the behavior of such systems without uh, the help of such tools is not easy. And we shall see how easily can we uh, specify and define the behavior of those kind of systems. In the last lecture, we studied a couple of examples of that. We also studied a state machine, which is uh, otherwise easier to specify using just a state uh, machine. Uh, but with the help of a Petri net, we give it some live uh, or a dynamic behavior. We know exactly where we are and we know what can happen next. In an otherwise a static state machine, this kind of information is not available. We saw a couple of examples. The first example was a producer-consumer problem, and the second example was a bounded buffer problem. And we saw how we used uh, Petri nets to specify the behavior of such systems. Before we continue with the Uh, more complex examples or other kinds of examples, uh, let me uh, take you back to some of the basic fundamental concepts so that we remember what this thing is all about. And then we shall uh, talk about those examples uh, that we see normally in our concurrent systems. So the models of those kind of things that we see in concurrent systems. So let me take you back to the basic uh, fundamentals of uh, Petri nets. Petri nets, they use something what we call a conflict. Remember that in a Petri net, we have four components. We have places, we have transitions, we have arcs, and we have tokens. Transition is enabled if the place that this transition has as an input has the required number of tokens that are needed by this transition. And that is given by the weight on this arc. And if nothing is written, that means it would need only one token in its enabling place. So we have this place here. We have the transitions. We have the arcs. We have the token in the enabling place. Petri nets, they use this mechanism, the mechanism what is called a conflict, to model concurrency and mutual exclusion and synchronization. So everything is modeled with the help of these kind of thing. In this conflict, the basic conflict here is that we have these two transitions we have a behavior in which we will choose among these two transitions, that is T1 and T2, 
arbitrarily, randomly, either this one or that one. And since both of these, they are sharing the same place, only one of the transition can fire. So looking at this thing, we are saying that T1 and T2, they are in conflict because only one of these will fire, both of these, they cannot fire. So the first thing that we see here is a um, conflict. Conflict is a very useful and powerful mechanism and tool. And we shall, wherever we need mutual exclusion, we create kind of a conflicting situation. Only one of the two can enter the critical section. Or both of these, they are mutually exclusive of each other. And that gives us a lot of power. And remember that in our concurrent systems, lots of problems, they required mutual exclusion. And this is how we model it. The second very useful uh, model is what is called a confusion. A confusion is a conflict and concurrency as well. This T1 and T2 here, they are not sharing the same place and hence these two are concurrent. Both of these, in principle, they can be executed in parallel. But we have a problem. That problem is with this T3. T3 uses input from these two places. So T3 is in conflict with T1 and T3 is in conflict with T2. So we have conflict. T3 is in conflict with T1 as well as with T2. And if, for example, T3 is fired, none of these two would be able to fire because this take token from here and token from here would be taken, and these two places, they would uh, have no tokens left, hence T1 and T2 could not be fired. If T3 is not fired, we can fire T2 as well as T1 independent of each other, and if we fire T2, then T3 cannot be fired because it will not have the enabling token in it, so the only option that we would have is T1, and the same is that if we fire T one, then we can only fire T2, not T3. This situation is called confusion. So here we have two separate things. One is concurrency. So we have places which are enabling transitions which are independent of each other. So, and then we have a place which is being enabled by those uh, places which are shared. When we have transitions which are enabled by places which are shared, then such a transition is in conflict with the other transition which is uh, sharing the same place. And when we have two transitions which are not sharing places, then these two transitions are concurrent. Now, concurrency obviously requires in principle, we say that these two can fire independent of each other, but it also requires that uh, the enabling places, they must have the required number of tokens present, only then the transition will fire. The situation that we saw here, this situation is called a symmetric confusion, because T1 and T2, they were symmetric, and T3 was in conflict and the conflict was asymmetric, same on both sides. The confusion could be asymmetric also. In this particular case, with the current marking, we have token at P1, P3, and P2. So P1 is enabled because it has tokens in both of its enabling places. 
T2 is enabled because it has a token in its enabling place, but T3 is not enabled because it has one token here, but this place does not have a token. So here we have T2 and this transition here, they are concurrent transitions. They can be executed in parallel and this is a situation that we have. This is uh, a concurrency with the current marking. Once this transition is fired, we will have tokens and, you know, assuming that this transition is not fired yet. So, once this transition is fired, we will have a token here. And when we have a token here, when then this transition and this transition, they are in conflict because they are sharing this P3 place here. So, only one of these can fire and once that transition fires, this token from here and here will be taken. And since this P3 will no longer have the token, the other side, even if it has a token, that cannot be fired. So now in this particular case, this P1 and this transition and T3 transition here, they are conflicting. But at the same time, we are sort of giving preference to this transition because the transition here is not enabled. It will be enabled after this transition is fired. And at that time, you know, we will create a kind of a conflict here. But currently, this has a preference over this. This can fire before we get a token here. So as long as we do not have a token here, this is not enabled and hence this is not in conflict with that. So here we saw a conflict which could occur potentially, but when we have the starting uh, marking, the conflict is not present there. We had concurrence there, but you know, after certain se uh, firing sequence, we can potentially have conflict. And since uh, in that particular case, it is possible that uh, P1 could fire, the, transi uh, the first uh, transition could fire before the second transition is enabled. Hence, we say that this is an asymmetric conflict. So this is an asymmetric confusion here. These confusions, conflict, confusion, and concurrency, these are the tools that we shall be using to model our concurrent systems. The next example that we are going to see, that example is a very old familiar example of what we call a par begin and par end. That is when we have a number of uh, parallel activities that can perform, but then they need to synchronize at some point in time before we can continue processing. Once again, if you remember from your operating systems class, that is a very important model and we need that kind of facility at many different places. So let me show you how can we model with the help of Petri nets. So here is our uh, model for par begin and par end. In par begin and par end, remember, we have something like this. We have activity 1, activity 2, activity n, and par end. All these activities they are supposed to be carried out in parallel. This is not sequential. And before we have something here, we execute this part. All of these activities, they must finish what they were supposed to do before we can come out of this block and execute this part. This is 
what our power begin and power end is. And this kind of thing can be modeled very easily with the help of petri nets. So here it is. What we need is we need a transition to fire to enable all these different places. So what we do is, let's assume that we had three activities. So we have a place with this marking here. When we have this thing, this means when this transition is fired, a token will be deposited in each one of these places. Now, let us just assume that we have some activity corresponding to each one of these. So these, actually this is not part of a petri net model, but you know, I'm just showing that we have these activities here. These activities are performed, maybe this is a longer activity and this one is a shorter activity and so on and so forth. But now what we want is we want all of these to synchronize. That means when this activity is complete, we want it to fire. Each one of these activities is fired and it deposits a token in a place which becomes Uh, an enabling place for this transition which is equivalent to this power end. So this is our power end. This is our power begin. So what we have is that you know these processes they may ta uh, take different amounts of time. Once they are done they will these transitions will be fired. And when all of the transitions have been fired, you know, this transition will be enabled because then we will have tokens deposited in each one of these and hence we will be able to move forth further. Now you see how easily could we model such an activity with the help of petri nets. We are saying to start with, they are all parallel activities. So they are all concurrent, so they are being enabled by firing the same transition. So we fire one transition and it deposits token in many different places and each one of the, uh, these places is a starting point for that parallel activity. So we continue with those parallel activities and these parallel activities, they may take, uh, take different amounts of times. Once they finish, each one of them will fire another transition that will put a token in the enabling uh, place where things are synchronized. So here we have things where all these activities, they are synchronized. So this is the synchronization point. And this will be ensured that we synchronize here by making sure that we have tokens present in all of these places. So we model this kind of activity very easily with the help of petri nets. Let me show you another uh, example, an interesting example which is otherwise possible uh, with the help of uh, state machines, finite state machines. But we shall see with the help of petri nets, the model is uh, very simple and it tells us a lot how different synchronizations take place. And the other very important and significant part of this model is that we can have different pieces uh, modeled separately and then join them together. 
if we had a finite state machine, that would not have been possible. And this is the example of a traffic light signal. In a traffic light, we have the three lights, red, yellow, and green. We go from green to yellow, from yellow to red, and then from red to green. So this is the cycle that we have. We can make a very simple state machine for that. We can have three states. The states would be my red, yellow, and green. And I go from green to yellow, from yellow to red, and then come back from red to green. So when I come from red, I don't have to pass through this yellow state. So this is a very simple model of a traffic light. As you can see here, with the help of a simple state machine, we can very easily model a single traffic signal where we have just one light. Now let us just assume that we are at a crossing. When we have a, at a, uh, our at a crossing, then we need to have two traffic lights and these two traffic lights, they will work in the similar fashion, but they need to be synchronized. So let me go to the second traffic light. So I have the second traffic light here. Once again, the same state machine. Let me call it red 2, yellow 2, and green 2. So let me call these red 1, yellow 1, and green 1. Currently, we have two traffic lights, and we have two state machines for these two traffic lights. Obviously, this model will not work properly. The reason for that is, although the cycle is specified properly, but we cannot have both greens at the same time. If we have both greens at the same time, that means traffic from both sides will come and there is a chance of an accident. So we have to synchronize these two signals. Now, when we have this state machine, we can easily model this kind of a thing with the help of state machine. But in this state machine, we will have a lots of states. That is, when light 1 is red, then light 2 can be either yellow or green. When light 2 is uh, green, light 1 cannot be yellow, light 1 cannot be red and so on and so forth. So we can make a model that from this state we go to this state, from this state we go to this state and so on and so forth. But note one thing here, that we cannot have, you know, these two separate state machines and then somehow join them together. We cannot have these two separate state machines which model one traffic signal each uh, in a very simplified manner, what we will have to do is we will have to come up with a new state machine which will be a totally different state machine from this one. Another uh, possibility would be, now we have a uh, traffic signal which controls many different roads. So it is not a regular uh, two roads coming from this side and two from this side. So it is not a regular crossing, but you know, there are multiple roads coming and you know, then we have to synchronize those as well. So modeling that would be 
once again very very difficult because now the state machine will grow and you cannot use the previously modeled uh, components for each signal. This kind of a difficulty can be overcome very easily with the help of a Petri net. How can we do that? Let me show you. We take a state machine, simple state machine, and convert it into a Petri net by simply adding transitions there. So note one thing here, that in a Petri net, we cannot have a direct link between two places. So the nodes here in the state machine, they become our places, and we put a transition between each one of these places. So we have put these places in this model and we have converted a state machine into a Petri net. Now we can put some initial marking here. For example, we say we have this initial marking here and that completes our Petri net. It converts that state machine into a Petri net which will behave in a similar fashion that that state machine would do. So here we saw that this state machine, you know, can be very easily converted into a Petri net. We have not done anything yet, but we have just converted the state machine into the Petri net. We have not solved the problem of synchronization yet. Once we have converted the state machine into the Petri net, then we worry about the synchronization part. These two traffic lights, they are supposed to work uh, together in a synchronous fashion so that when one is red, the other one is green. When this is green, you know, the other one is not yellow or uh, green because that will create some kind of a confusion. So they have to work synchronously. And we have to sort of provide this mechanism that they take turns, that you know, when one is red, the other is green, when the other is green, uh, the first one becomes red, and so on and so forth. And both of them, they cannot be green simultaneously, but they can be red momentarily, because at that point in time, it is possible that you know, both these you stop traffic from both sides, and then you know, you let the other side. Uh, uh, flow through the signal. Now we come to the synchronization point. We have to sort of understand what is the synchronization point. We go from red to green. What is the condition that this traffic should go from red to green? What is the condition there? The condition is when this traffic, this light goes from yellow to red, at this point in time, we allow this light to go from red to green and vice versa. So the synchronization point is here. That is, we, when we go from yellow to red, at that point in time, we will allow this transition to fire. So how can we allow this transition to fire at that point? You know, by very simply introducing a place here and enabling this place like this. And then we say that this place enables this transition also. Let us now look at this situation here. Let us just assume that we were here. green. So one was green, the other one, the second light was red. So from green, after the elapsed time, we go to yellow. When we go to yellow, this transition is enabled. When this transition is enabled, after whatever time that we have specified, this transition will fire and it will put tokens here and here. 
Now when we have tokens here, let's forget about this part for the time being. That will enable this transition because the transition has now tokens in both of its enabling places. So when that happens, this transition will fire and we will deposit a token here in the screen. Now, we cannot let this transition to be fired just like that. We have to control it. And how do we control it? We control it in the similar manner. That is, when we go from this yellow to this red, at that point in time, we send a token to a place, enabling place, which should enable this transition here. So these are the two enabling places. What we have done is we have just added these two places and put appropriate arcs to the transitions, which should be enabled by these places. And this model is a synchronous traffic signal model. You can see very easily with any marking, you have to, you know, have first some red and the other one green or yellow. And once you do that, then this signal will work properly. It will give turns to both these uh, sides of the traffic. Now you saw, with the help of the SpectriNet model, how easily could we take the previously developed simple components and then put them together and got our model for the entire system. Now if I had another traffic light, let's say, you know, this was a, an unusual kind of crossing and have I have another traffic light there. I could simply add the three lights there. And then maybe I would need to have some enabling places, some places that I need to uh, put there to enable different transitions in those uh, individual components. And nothing else would need to be changed. So I can, obviously, I have to connect these pieces together. That connection requires that I need to add something. But I don't have to redo everything which I would have to do in the case of st state transition model. The next example that we are going to see is another very famous example in concurrent systems and operating systems. And that is the example of uh, dining philosophers. Remember that uh, this dining philosopher's model is a very useful model where we talk about uh, different issues regarding concurrency, starvation, sharing, synchronization, uh, deadlocks, and all those different things. So in this particular example, we will come up with a PetriNet model for the dining, uh, dining philosophers. And once again, we shall see how easy it is to uh, do that. Uh, we will make a model for each philosopher separately, and then we will join them together. So let us build the model. In the dining philosophers, the dining philosophers, uh, they are in three different states. They are thinking. and then eating and maybe sleeping. The most interesting of these is this eating part. So the model is like that, if you remember, that we have a table, round table, around which we have some philosopher's settings. 
So the famous example has uh, five philosophers sitting around the dining table and they have, you know, the food placed there and they have forks. The important thing here is that a fork is, each philosopher needs two forks to eat and a fork is shared between the two adjacent philosophers. So the forks are put like that and they are shared, for example, this fork is shared between this and this philosopher. So if we have P1, philosopher 1, P1 and P2 here, this fork is shared, P2 in order to eat would need to get both these forks and then will eat. So once this fork is taken, if P1 wants to eat, cannot eat because this fork is not available, only one fork is available. And if uh, everybody picks one fork and then waits for the other, then we have a deadlock situation and so and so forth. So this is the famous dining philosopher's example and you must have studied this example in your operating systems. The concept here is, you know, the other states are not very important. The state that is the eating state is important and here uh, Dijkstra introduced the concept of shared resources. That is what kind of situation uh, arise when we have shared resources and you know when uh, these shared resources are organized in a circular fashion then potentially we have a circular kind of situation where everybody will pick one fork and will wait for the other fork because each philosopher simultaneously started to eat or desired to eat and eat and picked one fork before uh, he could pick the second fork that was taken by the other philosopher. So each one of these would have only one fork present and hence we will have a problem. Deadlock uh, can arise very easily. We can also have starvation but we will not discuss starvation for the time being in this particular case, in this particular model. Now let us try to build the Petrinet model for this dining philosopher. So what we need to do is, for each philosopher, we have to define these states. So a philosopher takes two forks, eats, and then when he is finished, he puts these forks back so that these forks can be used by somebody else. So we have, we take the forks, eat, and we put these forks back. So this is what we need to model. So let us do that. We will do it for one philosopher, and then we will, you know, sort of do the same thing for the rest of the philosophers, and then we will synchronize the activities. So let us assume that we have two places. These two places they are for the forks, fork one and fork two. When both these places are, have tokens, that is when both these places have token, they will enable this transition and this transition will model that is now this philosopher can eat. After the philosopher eats, so this is can eat, this is the philosopher eats, once the philosopher has finished eating, let me call it finished eating. At that time, both these folks, 
they are put back. So this is a very simple model of the dynamic philosopher, one philosopher. So what we need to do is we need to have, let's assume, you know, it does not matter how many philosophers, two, three, four, five, more than actually two. So we will have the second philosopher. So let me call it philosopher one eating. P1 eating and then P1 finished eating. Let's have the other philosopher. The other philosopher will need, let's just assume that we are modeling the system for four philosophers and we have the fork here let us call this fork F3. This is can eat P2. So that enables P2 to eat after P2 has finished eating. puts the folks down. Now, note one thing here, what is happening? This resource F2 is being shared between this philosopher and this philosopher, P1 and P2. And if P1 is eating, this fork is taken, this transition is disabled because there is no token present here. So when P1 starts eating, these tokens would be taken from here and we will deposit a token here. And we no longer have a token here. That means P2, the second philosopher, cannot take this fork because this transition is not enabled. Now let us complete the model for the rest of the philosophers. So we have the third philosopher. Same thing for the third philosopher. We have the transition here. This transition enables the third philosopher to eat, which fires when finished, deposits the token back. And the fourth philosopher, now we have, this is the fourth fork. Fourth fork is shared, now we are in a circle. The fourth fork is shared by this philosopher here. And this is, now this is, let's say, this is P2, this is philosopher three, and this is philosopher four. So initially, we would have tokens present in all those different places. So all the forks are available. Any philosopher can start eating. But note one thing here, that if, for example, this philosopher starts eating, these two tokens will be taken from here that disables both the adjacent philosophers. The third philosopher can still eat because there are tokens available in its enabling places, but there is no possibility of a deadlock in this particular case because a philosopher cannot take one token and wait for the other. Now, this dining philosopher's problem is one of the most important problems in operating systems and discusses uh, a lot of uh, things about the deadlock situations and all that. So this is, from that point of view, shared resources and deadlocks. The operating system has to manage shared resources and has to avoid deadlocks.
and it is an extremely difficult uh, thing to model and make sure and you know obviously we have literature there that you know tells us how to actually properly write an operating system where this kind of situation will not arise but modeling this thing is not easy so this is a classical example of concurrent systems where we have shared resources so we want resources to be shared and we do not want uh, the processes to unnecessarily uh, stop other processes from completing their work or executing what they need to execute. If a resource is present for the uh, process and the process can use that resource, then in that particular case, we would let that process use that. So here are the complexities. That is, we don't want unnecessary uh, delays. We don't want uh, deadlocks. We want mutual exclusion, but we do not want deadlocks. And this model talks about all those different things there. One thing that we did not talk in this particular case, and then we did not actually handle that situation, was the case of what we call starvation condition. How to handle starvation using pet nets. But otherwise, you saw how easily were we able to model a complex problem like dining philosophers using this petri net. And the model uh, uh, here ensures that there will be no deadlock. Why? Because two transitions cannot uh, fire simultaneously. So only one transition will fire. That means when that transition fires, it uh, takes the tokens from the enabling places. That means the other transition which uh, uh, was uh, in conflict with this transition now cannot fire and cannot possess uh, these resources partially and wait for the other resources. Cannot hold and wait. Remember, in a deadlock kind of situation, we have the situation of hold and wait. And if we uh, do that, that means we will enter a deadlock. Petri nets, models with petri nets can also uh, have deadlocks in them and starvation and all those kind of things. Uh, and we will have to talk about those situations where uh, it can potentially enter into a deadlock kind of situation, but that will come a little later when we talk about uh, the different properties of the petri nets and the analysis techniques for the petri nets. But here, the point was that we could uh, model complex problems with the help of petri nets. So what we did was we simply modeled one philosopher, the folks and the eating process and all that, and then we repeated the same process for the rest of the uh, philosophers, and we are done. Very simple kind of a model there. When we model our systems with the help of petri nets, we we have to talk about certain properties of the petri nets. And these properties, and you know, in order to make sure that uh, the model is uh, properly done, these properties are very important. What are those properties? They, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, analysis for deadlocks and those kind of situation. Before we could do the analysis for deadlocks and those kind of things, we need to talk about certain properties. And these properties are uh, four or five of them, six actually, uh, that uh, mostly come into play. And before we can do any kind of analysis, we need to know what these are and what, is this, what are the significances of these properties. So let me take you onto the slide. Uh, I will briefly introduce those properties without actually going into too much detail today because I am running out of time. But inshallah, in the next lecture, I will elaborate these in more detail. So let me take you onto the slide and we talk about those properties. So we have the behavioral properties. The first thing is called reachability. Question is, can we reach one 
particular state from another. Reachability plays a very important role in determining uh, the deadlock and the starvation kind of situations. So the uh, question that we ask is that we are in a uh, particular state. Can we, from this re uh, state, can we reach some other state in our system eventually after firing some sequence of transitions? And if we cannot, that means that there is probably a problem. The second question that we have is the boundedness. Will a storage place overflow? Boundedness means that, you know, we are depositing tokens into places when a transition fires. A place can be, uh, can be a buffer or something similar. So the boundedness says when we are depositing tokens into that place, is there an upper limit that we have on that place, the upper limit on the number of tokens that this place can eventually have? And if there we have a system in which uh, uh, there is some mechanism by which we are just depositing tokens into this place and, you know, eventually this place can become full or overflow and then we may have a problem there. So we will also look at the examples of boundedness. Then the other important property is the liveness. Will the system die in a particular state? This liveness, you know, this petrinet is supposed to be uh, used to model processes. We need to make sure that the process continues. Is the system live? Will it stay there? Will it uh, continue? And liveness probably has some relationship with the reachability also. So these are the three fundamental properties. We will have some other properties and we'll talk about those properties in the next lecture. Uh, inshallah, in that lecture, we will uh, elaborate those things in more detail also. Till the next lecture, uh, Khuda Hafiz or Aslam Alaikum.